this is the area that we're dealing with. We're trying to discern productively so that people have a much more open sense of their position vis-a-vis -vis ideas, concepts, adults, the real world. And it's a funny paradox that the most artificial structure you could make, which is theatre, is actually one of the best tools for creating the real exchange and getting rid of that fictional relationship between bloody teachers and, and real people. This is an interesting paradox to me, that it's one of the ways it works. But in the drama framework, <clears throat> it seems to me something different happens. Not special, but different. And that is what we're to try to communicate to colleagues. In the drama framework, frequently you're dealing with areas of human experience and ponderings where you really don't have any answer. And you don't have any given, proven knowledge. Because human nature isn't built that way. So frequently what one is doing is making one's own contribution as an adult in the room, but doing it in a teacherly fashion that enables them to learn. So we have an amazing choice of the kinds of contributions we can make. Some of those choices I'd like to you know, try and share this, these two days with you. The child's principal role is that of cooperating with the teacher, cooperating with not leaning on and not resistant to. But the outward form, the final form, is basically they explain the world to each other. They explain it to each other. So one of the things we can do, and this is the big thing back, of course, is we don't have to accept the view that is regarded as the gospel view in school. That when a child walks into school, it is called a pupil. It is therefore treated as a pupil. In drama, you can't teach that way. Because in drama, you are setting up social encounters that inquire into the ways of mankind and that celebrate the affairs of mankind. Now, these affairs may be scientific affairs. Or they may be emotional effect, depending upon what the curriculum is at a given time and the conceptual learning you want the children to begin to understand at any given time. Therefore, it is not possible for you to continue to teach children as if they are pupils. They have to become persons of some account. Now, you don't get in pupil by saying, don't call yourself pupils. I'm never going to call you pupils. You're not students. What you have to do is shift your own engagement with them so they find they are not pupils. So, one of the things we can do, the whole school can do it, the whole profession can do it, the universities have certainly do it, but they don't want to do it. We can change the frame by which the student enters the school. In the drama room, you can do it deliberately. Uh, if I may give you an example of this. A teacher of nine-year-olds in Newcastle, no, they weren't, they were eight at the time. She said, I'd like to start some junior science now, seriously. I'd like to follow them through now, these next two years, before they go up to the high school with serious scientific inquiry. It's a very good junior school, this. It's an inner city junior school. The kids come from artisan parents who dress them well, haven't a lot of notion about a variety of talk at home, that they care. And they'll come into school, most of them, if you ask them to. But the children are not necessarily endowed with a lot of talk from home. So school tends to be their main source of talk. They get out of orders at home and their mums are off from working because their dads are out of work now. She said, I'd like to start this scientific inquiry, you know. I'm thinking of Dr. Lister. 
as being something that would interest them at eight and a half. And maybe we could go on then to Pasteur's experiments, but she said, I want, I want the language, I want the language of observation, the keen eye, the language of inquiry, the language of experiment, the language of the imagination that could see beyond the experiment to where it might take this, you see. So she said, would you come in and teach the first bit for me? And so I talked about Dr. Lister. Now, of course, I didn't know much about Dr. Lister. I, I don't know how much you know about Dr. Lister. I didn't know much. And he would sort of develop carbolic, and he'd have a spray, and, you know, this, that, and the other. And that he was living contemporary with Pasteur. Now, you see, we can treat them as students, which is the way they normally talk, and say, now, we're going to study Dr. Lister. Or we can change the frame. Now, this was the frame that was changed. I'll just have to show you this, because you can't discuss frame change. The children came in, and as they came in, I gave them, I just said, do take a letter. Thank you. So they took a letter, A, B, C, D, that's all it was. And they were, they said, Mrs. Hefkin, a bit bewildered, you know, I mean, they knew me as Mrs. Hefkin. Sat down, and I'd arranged the table so that the first six letters sat together, the next six letters. So they were random boys and girls, which is no problem for that school. I then said, I'm going to put on my university gown this morning. So I put it on. And I wrote on the blackboard, History of examination, it, 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 sorry, history of medicine, examination day one. And then said, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I understand there are no absences, and today is our first paper in the history of medicine. Are there any questions about the paper? Now, of course, the kids are only watching at it. Yes. <laughs> Are there any questions about the paper? The boy said, is it going to be a long one? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, it will be the usual hour. There will only seven or eight or nine. It will be the usual hour of, of course, uh, uh, on behind closed doors. So I take up a great big envelope. I just use old stuff, you know, and I just have <laughs> silence examination in process. Stick it so that the headmistress knows not to come in, and plonk it so that she can see it so she knows what's going on, of course. Today's paper, ladies and gentlemen, concerns this gentleman here. The gentleman here being actually the lady teacher, who's sitting with a bow tie on and a white shirt with a bit of a frill, and a silver cane, behind the table on which are instruments of the period of listening, the University of London instruments. Your task today, ladies and gentlemen, is to consult this portrait of Sir Joseph Lister. You will find that all his concerns are there upon the table. However, there is one rule in this examination, because I've had to make it. I promised the university when they lent me the instruments for the medical. <laughs> they said, you're not going to use these today, now, are you? I said, well, please, Mrs. Hepburn. They said, don't let them touch them. I said, well, what? They're sharp, they say. They're scalpels and needles. And they're rusty and they'll get tummy poisoning and God knows what. Please don't let them touch them. So I promise. And there were jugs of blood. But uh, they were dry now, of course, I mean, they wouldn't stick. But they were as fresh, apart from being dry, as the daily stagotum, only they weren't listers, but they were the right thing. <laughs> so here am I, with my, you know, so. However, ladies and gentlemen, you do realise, under examination conditions, the eyes alone must be used. Yes. <laughs> You may discuss in twos, threes, fours, in any way you wish, the affairs that concern this gentleman in his life. On the table, apart from the instruments, there was one um, microscope. It wasn't exact as to period. I couldn't get a period microscope. They're not changed much. 
And also on the table was the uh, certificate of the right university. It was Edinburgh, but it had the wrong name. It was written in Latin because University of Edinburgh does hand out its medical degrees in Latin. Uh, however, it did not say Joseph Vista on it. And I, I said, so Joseph's uh, own certification, I'm afraid, we have not been able to obtain. However, it is completely authentic otherwise. So you see, you've got children coming round, and uh, you heard, it wasn't two minutes before I heard uh, it's microbiology. It was microbiology. It was, it's definitely in medicine. Because these are nice for cutting people off. Yes, and it's germs because it's a microscope. So they begin to list what they consider. So they have about an hour on this. They may consult with me, but of course as the examination person, I can't give any information. So as a child comes up with a question, I'm asking another question back, which really has the answer in it if it can unfold it. Now you see, at the end of that time, they have listed in groups what they thought were the possible concerns. So I'm going to treat you as if you're doctors. And we also have a very famous doctor, Dr. Lister. He, of course, is not really Dr. Lister. He's going to be the portrait of Dr. Lister for us today. Now, what we're going to do every day is have a medical examination to see if the doctors have been well trained. You're not going to examine a person. You're going to be examined to see if you know about the history of medicine, you see. And, of course, it's a drama about it. So we know you don't really know much about the history of medicine. At least I don't. Do you know a lot about it? No, I don't. But I'll bet it's a very interesting thing, the history of medicine. And he looks as if he lived a long time ago, doesn't he, really? We've tried to make him look as if he does. And, of course, he will move occasionally, because he's only a person, and it's very hard to sit absolutely still. Now, put your number in front of you. Now, from now on, this is an examination, and we're not going to hassle with these numbers. The first thing, though, before we start the exam, I thought we'd better have a look at how do you think doctors learn best to be doctors? And I thought we'd put these in some sort of order that we think's the best way of learning, and we'll put them down so that the thing we think's most important comes here, and gradually they'll come in the right order for us. I was working with some nine-year-olds on the Dr. Lister work a couple of years ago, and I said to them, I think we should discuss first, or plan first, what are the best ways of finding out something if you don't know it? And even at nine, the children said, of the, of the prepared 20 cars of different learning strategies, and they said, the first, the best, the most important is go to an expert, and let them tell you. And the next thing is ask somebody who knows better than you. The idea of trying it to see if you can do it was put last at the beginning of the week. At the end of the week, of course, it was a totally different rearrangement. Because when you're somebody like Dr. Lister, there isn't anybody you can go to. Because nobody will help you with carbonic. So what's he going to do? And the children still felt, you know, it was better to wait to something. Yeah. <laughs> that was on the Monday, and on the Friday, they changed the that. Now, the second thing is, you see, as you develop the pupil use of strategies for learning, you then, of course, change the learning as possible. Now, what do you think should go first as the best way of learning of any of those? What do you think? Get the facts. You think getting the facts right? Anybody disagree with that? What do you think? 
You think asking other people is the best, yes? Experiment. Do you want to experiment about it? Mm -hmm. someone else. I wondered myself whether sometimes you can learn best by trying to tell others before you know much. I think you can do that. Do you think you have to know a lot before you can tell anybody else? Hmm. You think you should do your thinking first. Hmm. So first we have to do the thinking. Then we have to read about what we've been thinking about. Is that it? Then that gets us the facts. Then we talk it over. Then we make somebody else do it. Then we do it. Then we check the results. And then we tell other people. What am I going to do with this one then? When is it to tell an expert, they would tell them how to do it exactly or if they've got it right or... Uh, yes, if you try telling somebody that knows better than you, they'd help you check if you were correct. Well, shall I leave it up there or move it down like this gentleman suggests? It's your examination. Doctors. And we're ready then. From now on, I shall treat you as doctors. As if you've done a medical training and you're passing the first of the important examinations that will allow you to become doctors in the National Health Service of this country. I'm very pleased to see that you came in without any bags or coats, because certainly we should have had to take them away from you. Hmm. All historical exhibits remain the property of the College of Surgeons. Any questions? I fear, ladies and gentlemen, it means that if you fail this examination, you will not be able to resit it. But I'm quite sure that the training you've had will have thoroughly equipped you for any of the problems that you will face this week. Are you feeling nervous? Is anyone feeling nervous? Good. Very well. The examination will commence. We should like you, first of all, in your groups, to carefully study this room that we have placed at your disposal. Sir Joseph today will answer no questions. There are three questions you have to find the answers to and write down what you think. You do not have to wait to write what you know. Only what you think is the truth. You are to think about what this man is most concerned with when he's working. You know already he is a doctor. But what kind of a doctor? And what kinds of things would you expect to find him doing? Every time you have decided anything, write it down. I shall write the three questions on the board when I have transferred these cards to there. Let the examination begin now. Remember that all doctors must have access to the museum. She thought it might be the best for the nurse. 
looks like you've got the bloodstream and the uh, ah, mostly the breathing apparatus, but this suggests the bloodstream as well. Yes, yes, yes. One does wonder um, what kind of bacteria the man might have been looking into. way in which you have conducted this first part of your medical examinations. Now, I'll take this off. So, the examination for today is over. Was it interesting? Hmm. I thought it looked rather interesting. I then said that they could ask the portrait anything they wished if they wanted to confirm any of their opinions. So, of course, you've got children coming up like saying, um, Did you personally use these scalpels? What did you thread the needles with? Was it really cat gut? And so, of course, you're getting this business of what do the children already know? I mean, they've seen enough movies these days. Kids are very, very knowledgeable. Uh, and so on. And then they sat down. And under examination condition, with Sir Joseph still sitting here, because she wanted to look at them, it's her class, I'm sure. And I mean, I'm interfering with it. Uh, I stood there, you may begin, ladies and gentlemen, take up your pencils. And they wrote their names on the top. Are you surprised that they all wrote a doctor? <laughs> Dr. John Smith, <laughs> Dr. Sandler, and uh, you know, they knew it was a, a history of medicine exam, not an examination for practicing medicine. That was very clear in the beginning. And they wrote an hour's paper. And nobody looked up. At lunchtime, they asked the teacher if they could have a two hour paper tomorrow. <laughs> because, of course, it was very intriguing. May I introduce you to these doctors? Uh, they've taken the trouble to travel to meet you and to hear about your work. Uh, they realize that you uh, haven't time for a big lecture, and so they have certain questions they'd like to put to you. Uh, will you mind if they have a little discussion first? Oh, not at, all. They... not at all, I understand. Well, you'll wait here till you find out what you want to know, and then it's up to you. I wonder that drives people to become doctors. To save people from dying? Yes, well, that was very similar to the sorts of thoughts I had. To save people. Hmm. Anything else? It's a good experience. Oh, it certainly is. It's a wonderful experience. It must be nice when you just save somebody's life and they're all thank very thankful for you. Well, they are. They are very thankful. I remember uh, when I worked on a boy called uh, James... What was his name? It was a long time ago now. James Greenlees. He was only 11. And a cart, a 
run over his knee, just here, and he'd broken his knee, and his skin was broken. And of course they thought he was going to die. About every second one did, but he recovered. Did any one of your patients die? Oh, yes. Well, I felt very, very sad because um, I felt that I could. If only I could have perfected my method, and if only those others had listened to me, I could have saved them. I felt that people died that they shouldn't have died. What would you do? Well, it depended on the disease. Some diseases we could uh, we could cut, cut the, the uh, diseased parts of the body away. But there are others that I'm afraid I couldn't do much for. We tried to make them comfortable, but well, at least in my wards we tried to make them comfortable. Well, I'm afraid some people weren't so helpful. But I've never never actually been in the hospitals I run myself. So. Do you always feel depressed when you when you try an experiment and just Now that's a very good question. Yes, I, I'm afraid I, I do feel depressed. I often feel depressed. Uh, not so much about the experiments, but about the people that are around me. Because some of them, really. Some patients not want to go through without relations. Sorry? Many of them. Do you know that I've had patients who come to me and they said, you're not going to put carbolic acid on my legs because it'll burn. And I said, I said, it's the only way you're going to survive. Would they listen to me? No. They wouldn't listen. And not only them, of course, it was the doctors in, in London. They were the worst. Sits, cold water. Dickens. Sir Joseph? Yes, yes. Would you mind helping us put ourselves in the right places so that when you used to lecture to young medical mm. students, we are standing or sitting like you are used to? Certainly. Is that certainly. possible? Oh, certainly, yes. Did you lecture in your operating theatre? Oh, yes, we certainly did. We, we used to have a, a, a semicircle of seats. Could, could we do that? Let's stand in a semicircle. We can't sit up, right? No, no. In my experiments, I've taken flasks like this. Actually, more like this one here. This isn't exactly the sort of flask I did use, but it's, it's similar. I take a flask like this, and I'll fill it with blood, or I fill it with a broth, a beef broth, and I'd seal it, I'd boil the broth, I'd put a muslin cloth over the top here, and then I would draw out the glass tube thin on this end, so it was still open, so the air could still get in, but the germs couldn't get in because they couldn't get through the bends in the glass tube. I took those flasks around time after time after time. I showed them to the people. I said, look, this flask has had blood in it for three years. It's had beef broth in it for three years. And it's perfectly clear. And the blood is perfectly good. But they said, oh, no, no, no. They said, they just wouldn't believe me. They said I was a quack. On the second day, the second question, Sir Joseph was upset, so she was not in a portrait. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, some of it could handle the material that I promised they couldn't. I photocopied it all. I mean, it's silly to put the microscope on a photocopy machine, but it makes quite a good image. <laughs> so that if you're in the exam head, <coughs> that one of the questions they had to answer was to take any tool from Dr. Wister's equipment, consider its use, and design the operation 
as they thought it might have happened. They could draw the design, whether the surgeon would have students around, how the patient would be placed in the 19th century, and how his tool would be used, and to what purpose. So, of course, you've got children with paper scalpels denying the operations according to what they understood about the 19th century. Now, of course, naturally, at eight and a half, they didn't realise that Joseph couldn't open anybody up because they didn't know they couldn't do that. It was forbidden. So, it was as much as he could do to set a kneecap. So, all this part is, you know, out of bounds, as you might say. As a journalist. Well, naturally, some of the children, you know, brought in uh, Dr. Kildare, <laughs> this and the other. But it's interesting how they brought in as curiously old fashioned Dr. Kildare of 19th century sense, you know, of how central heating would look and the 19th century was coming in in old pictures. Anyway, the second day was this. Sir Joseph was very upset. As you know, Sir Joseph Lister didn't get on well with people, he was a very awkward character. And he got his wife to write all his letters because she softened them and made them easier. However, he was writing to Pasteur. He was one of the few people who listened to Pasteur. So we had his life history in her hand. And she's walking up and down. And the children were to engage, because the medical students, your task today, ladies and gentlemen, is to engage Sir Joseph Pasteur in conversation about the things that worried him in his life. And for this, of course, the teacher cannot do that teacher talk. She can only do affective, upset, Dr. Lister talk. So the date we fixed was a certain day in October, whatever it is now, I can't remember, when he had asked if a child's kneecap could be set. And the father had said no, and the mother had said yes. And for it to be done in the way he could do it, where the child would undoubtedly live, it would need to be encased in steel, so the carbolic was pressed into the wound, you see, and there was no fuss. And so there he was, with half the family saying, you're not touching my last kneecap. He'd been kicked off by a big car horse. You're not touching my last kneecap. And the mother was saying, oh, let him, let him try, because look, he'll never walk again. And Lister had to take that decision. And not very nice personality. Not easy. A shy man with the child there in agony. Then he chose to follow what the mother said. At great risk to himself from being kicked by a collier, you know. And so that was what the children came out with. If you hear that question, we have it on video tape, you get things like, when you're upset, you get knotted inside. You look very knotted inside. Knotted inside. I could, sometimes, I could get the face of the earth clear of such men. Who won't allow their children to be put out of them. And so on, so on. So they then had, of course, to write their second paper on some of the frustrations <coughs> and agonies of Dr. Lister regarding the personality that discovered he had. So they did a two hour play that day. And so it went on. When you take in <coughs> some pictures of 19th century workers <coughs> blown up this size and you say, we have a big problem for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Take one of these pictures and turn them upside down so that you don't need to choose because you're medical students. You take what you give them or what you give them. <coughs> Every one of these pictures represents a health hazard of two or three or fifty-seven. We would like you in your examination today to list all health hazards from this work. To create an accident in still life and then to lecture on the extra hazards when the doctor calls. Now, for an eight and a half year old to handle that is a massive problem because everybody knows that when the doctor comes, things get better in our country <coughs> as a rule. 
But they didn't in this day. If the doctor came, they were likely to get worse. So I well remember a group of children picked up a picture of milkmaids carrying yolks and milk you know, around Newcastle. Their health hazard they chose to be, a lady was kicked by a cow here. And it was very severely bruised and torn. And they thought that she might lose something important. They weren't sure what, but something important you know, might be lost by this cow kicking. So that was what they then, they listed of course many health hazards like hairs in the milk, TV cattle, um, buckets dropping on your feet and cutting you and all the things you could think of, you know, getting um, frostbite in, in bad weather, you know, milking, uh, picking up germs from the dirt on the cows and this, that and the other. And, um, being breathed on by cows. <laughs> but when they came to make their wax museum, you see, they had the girl lying down. I have been kicked by a cow just here. It hurts me. Uh, I have taken a piece of my petticoat and I am putting it over the bruise. I am boiling a kettle but it takes a very long time because the fire is not very big and so on and so on and so on and so on. And then the health hazard when this sir comes in, he's going to be carrying all those germs from an Edinburgh hospital where at the foot of every bed, and they were not told it, <clears throat> the foot of every bed was a bucket of pus. And that walked into your house. So they were listening. All the germs that Mister was bringing, his hands, his hands, of course, were washed because he insisted on it. But he still thought that the germs were in the air and not on the things. You see, so it's a very complicated exercise they were doing. So of course, it's going to catch you all the time that you must discuss without any evidence of teacher talk. Could you now then divide yourselves into groups, into those table groups, and just sort of settle yourselves around so that you can see this table here. But I'd like to be sure, I keep looking at you in your groups. And you'll notice today I'm not even putting on my examination gown because we've a lot of work to do before we actually start the examination this morning. You'll also notice, of course, that um, the gentleman who's been uh, being Dr. Lister for us every day today isn't dressed like him. And that's not because he's forgotten his suit, but because I said, don't change into Dr. Lister's clothes today. Because today he's going to represent him just like you will in your pictures. We're going to make pictures that tell stories. First of all, we're going to make this gentleman tell a story of Dr. Lister's time, and you can help me make the picture. Would you mind coming forward? Now you can put on Dr. Lister's glasses so that we remember that you're going to be Dr. Lister for us. Well, what do you think? Does he look as if he's annoyed with the microscope? Is, is it right? Is that what we want it to be? There's something wrong somewhere. Yes. See what happens if he walks now nearer to the microscope, still saying to himself, and it's in here that it's wrong, there's something wrong about this, and tell him when to stop, right? <laughs> ah, yes. My goodness me. Doesn't he look cross? Yes. Now then. Do you think we've made enough pictures for you to know about making pictures of your own? Right. Spread out then in your groups. And we'll all try one together now. And what we want you to do is use the picture to help you decide on an accident that Dr. Lister might be called to 
to deal with. The picture shows some people, there's always a lot of people in the pictures, and they're always working. What we want you to do is make the picture of when they've been taken home and you're waiting for the doctor. Right, that's yours, get on with it, start. 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 I think that's probably better than the group. That's yours. Now. about this lady has been kicked by a cow whilst milking, won't you? Then we know what this accident's about. Well, you didn't know you were going to have a fractured skull and a bone problem today, did you? Right. this afternoon, you'll have the picture you've been using, which is full of clues about problems when people are sick, health hazards, things that can make that wound worse. You've also got the picture you've made of an exact accident. And what we want you to do in your examination is work in groups and list every hazard to health that you can find from that picture where the accident happened to that picture in the house where you tried to deal with it. Now, is that clear? So you know that the lady who had an accident here got kicked and trampled on by a cow. So you know the problems of the dangers to health there. <clears throat> Today you have a different task to do for your examination. I'm going to read out to you quite carefully what this task is. For today's examination, you have to plan for that time when you may find yourself at high speed, taking all your instruments, 
to work for the good of sick people. Any problems, I'm in the office. I'm just going to phone up to see how much longer they'll give us. Does anybody know the number of the British Medical Association? So you must just keep it in. I know, but what if it did best? It would just, you'd have to make a special sort of aluminum or something. But you see what I mean, the head? And then the tap would be so in about, well, it would be near the bottom, yeah? And you can have just like a, um, like a plastic thing or like what man a drum board. Put your pencils down, you know, because I don't think this is going to help him for a minute. And uh, do you know how high this one is? How high this table is? Well, let's stand back and have a look. Uh, I'm five foot six. I don't know in centimetres. Have you got a centimetre ruler? Because the you know how you know how the ambulance swaps through traffic? Mm -hmm. It's easy to get a boot on the back. Mm -hmm. Same so with the front. Just go see, you know, see that Because it's going to be it from there to there. Okay. If you had a temperature, it would be cool. After it goes to a seat, in temperature? Look, they make a thermometer. Right. Well there. So many degrees, right? Yeah, she goes again. Right? So many degrees. And it hits the top. So it goes and there's the water. And when it reaches that little it's that light that floats up and it hits the buzzer. Yeah, that's a good idea. I put it, how, how is it going to just float up and hit the buzzer? Oh, I've got it, because it's all, like all the roof, all the roof's like, you know, it's all your tiny little needle. I know the needle would um, float up, right? Or even if the water hits the roof. I heard it, it just, yeah, the noise anyway. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes? Morning. Good morning. I believe we have an appointment with the, the new factory manager. Yes, yes. You're from the British Medical Association. That's correct, yes. <clears throat> uh, will you just wait here a moment? Sir. It's the man from the British Medical Association. Now look, he knows we haven't had much chance to discuss this, but at the same time, when we tell him about things, Make sure that you explain what you mean if you can, because I don't want him going back saying, I didn't understand half of what those people said, you know. <clears throat> uh, I'm just going to bring you into my office for a moment. My engineers are just busy finishing off their plans. Um, do, do, do have you want to get some of that one? I think that would be better because it wouldn't need as much. That's a very important one. Uh, um, we made it of lava steel out of case with... What's this going to be inside? What's the stuff inside made of? It's made of foam rubber and the sterilising unit is like liquid. So mm. the foam rubber soaks it up and keeps everything oh, sterilised. That's a very interesting innovation. So whenever the um, instruments are put back in, they are automatically mm -hmm. sterilised. Mm. And there's an emergency bed. For it lift the glass, it's got a tough glass panel on top so you can see everything inside. Mm. And when you lift it out, you pull the pole on the bed and it like inflate. Oh, I see. That's a very interesting idea. So if, if we can't get the, um, the the full size bed, we can just use this as for an emergency. And um, the locks are, you have a, a cord that you push in. Then undo the combination and it'll open. An Good. identity card. I see, so a magnetic identity yeah. card. Fine. Mm -hmm. Was it? We've got one another special thing about putting on where it um, identifies his fingerprints. Well, that sounds even better than the, uh, the radar system uh, for security. 
you're going to actually key the fingerprints of the surgeon to the, um, to the, the, the box itself. Yes. We'll have to have a system if the surgeon changes over, you know, on shift duty or anything. Uh, have you got a backup system for that in case? Yes, by putting two systems on, by putting one for the staff and one for the surgeon. Very useful. Mm. Yeah. You see, we do think quite carefully when, when we know what the job is. On the fifth day, Dr. Lister, I said to the children, I think, you know, <coughs> we ought to try and help him understand what progress science made because of it. Now, remember, they've been taught nothing about doctors. They've not been seen a lecture. All they've done is meet him and deal with problems of perception about him. I wasn't a bit surprised to find that the children were coming in with information on him. Uh, I didn't need to tell them about his family and so on. We've got all that organised, worked out. <laughs> we didn't provide a great many books in the room because we weren't particularly interested in that sort of learning at this stage. So I said, we'll have to think about things that have developed because of him. And they said, well, we'll explain a dialysis machine to him. And I said, well, I don't have a dialysis machine. I said, well, you could work it out, you know, with him. So I said, all right. And we made the convention that he was busy working, he was writing up the success of that boy's operation. So he could knock on his desk and say, excuse me, can I come into the 19th century? And this survived around the convention, of course, would say, I'm here, can I help you? So you get these two boys on this dialysis machine. Now, you know about kidneys, Dr. Lister? Oh, yes, 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 yes. You know where they are? Hmm. Further the back. <laughs> and they're like this. Now, we've got a, a machine that makes the kidneys work better. Really, says Lister. How does it work? Well, we're not sure of whether you take the kidneys out and put them into something. <laughs> but we're going to find out. You see what I mean by explaining the world to one another? They don't have to pretend they know. We're not sure how it works yet. We think it's a kind of suitcase. And something goes in the suitcase and comes back again. We don't know if it's blood or water or kidneys. But when we do know more, we'll come back and tell you some more, you know, about it. But the vocabulary, of course, is word like bypassing um, elements and so on and so on. The one that I'm so proud of is the one I would never have been able to say. And I said, I've got it. He said he's looking very miserable because he thinks he knew not and we know everything, which is not right. So I said, well, if you can help him over that one, I think it would be very helpful. He went in. Can I not, can I speak to the 19th century? I'm here, can I help you? All the way he said, I'm going to show you, Dr. Lister, a band-aid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could have, oh, I could have just kissed him. I never thought of it as that. He goes, you take that bit off there, you take that bit off there, you clap it on, and that's what you gave us. Have you ever seen anything more efficient? A band-aid. And the kid had gone from a steel plate and carbolic sprays to a bandit and was able to say the 20th century couldn't happen if it hadn't been clean. Because they're clean right through. He's going to walk over there like going back to the 19th century and then he's going to knock. Is there a place you could knock on? Where, where will you knock? Which bit are you going to knock on? I mean, are you going to actually knock on his desk right in the room, or...? You'll knock on that bookcase. And then we'll see if his century says, come in, right? And I don't know what you'll do to explain that you know, we don't belong to his century. I don't know whether he'll ask you or whether he'll expect you to tell him. I think you can manage. Anyway, you can always come back if you can't. Right. Let's see what happens when you knock. Oh, come in. <laughs> I 
can I help you? Um, I'm from a different time. I'm from in the 19th, the 20th century. And we've come back in time to tell you what modern, modern doctors have invented since your time. Hmm, that's tremendous. And uh, can you tell me anything about my work? So if we go again, if other people go, you know, and we, we'll all have things to tell him, does that seem a reasonable way to do it? To knock on the door, explain which century we're in. You will. Right, what are you going to tell him about? Right. Now, we'll all listen to what he's going to say about this kidney machine, and then we'll see whether there's any el anything else. Tell us for a bit. Tell us the sorts of things you think he ought to know. That a kidney can do is that the kidneys never charge themselves. I see. Is there anything else we should tell him about the kidney machine? I don't know how big they are, do you? I mean, can he carry them in a suitcase? Or <laughs> can he not? Oh. Well, how big are they? I mean, if we had to try and explain to him, we're going to have to try and give him some idea of how big it is. I mean, does the patient creep inside it, or what? Does anybody know? Uh -huh. it's, yeah. It's at the side of a, um, a bed or something, and they, like, plug it into themselves? They have it at the side of their bed, and they plug it into themselves, in some way to the blood. I see. And put, they put, like, tubes in their body, where, where the part is, like... Yes. You know, one of the things he's bound to ask, because I think doctors are a bit like this, he'll, he'll want to know everything, you know. Which bit do you change? You know, when you're dealing with a kidney machine, do you keep pushing new kidneys in and taking old ones out? Or what is it a kidney machine does? That, you know, I don't want you to land yourself uh, with him asking you things and the 20th century can't explain it. Does anybody know what these kidney machines actually do to the kidneys? Make them work. <coughs> they actually make them work better than before? No, um, sometimes people's kidneys don't work, so they have to make them work. Oh, come in. Can I help you? Yes, I'm, I'm one of the fellow surgeons of the person who's just been in. I can tell you about one of the things that the 20th century has brought, it's um, called a kidney machine. A kidney machine? Do you mean a, me a mechanical kidney? I, well, can't, I can't believe it. No, it's, it's like this big box and um, you plug it into yourself and it, make, it does the work that your kidneys would do for so long while the kidneys recharge themselves. I find that Amazing. Do you mean that we can actually reroute the blood through this machine? Yes. That's fantastic. Is it, uh, is it a mechanical? Does it work by clockwork, this machine? I don't know, dear. <coughs> I think it works on electricity. Electricity? Ah, oh, I, I have heard something about that. Um, I remember they were working on, uh, on frog's legs. You have the, the jump, the electricity in the nerves. Does it work off the nerves? Mm. I find it very hard to believe. Could you excuse me for a minute? Oh, certainly. I must get on What was that about frog's legs? Mm. 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 And is that what this for you about? Uh, is there anything else about the blood bank? Uh, um, the, the, the blood is stored like money is stored in a bank. That's why we call it a bank. Is that, is that right? I don't want to tell him anything that's wrong, you know, for the 20th century. 
Uh, now, what else are we going to say about that? Uh, I've never understood where they got the blood from. From other people. It's sure to want to know how we persuade people to take, the, you know, to give their blood away to a bank. Can you cope with that if uh, if he asks you? Well, now let's think. Then, what are we going to say about how we persuade people to give up their blood? What are you going to say? Yeah, like some people have accidents, so that um, we persuade them to give blood. So the people who've lost a lot of blood, they can pump that blood into them. So they do it by saying, "Will you help somebody who's had an accident?" Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose I would give blood if I thought it would help somebody. What I don't understand is how do they know that the blood you give fits the person who's had the accident? I mean, I'm a lady and the person might be a man. Can ladies' blood mix with men's blood? Well, in the blood bank, they're all labelled and there's different types of blood and you take a sample of the person who's had an accident and you pair it up to whatever blood's in the blood bank, the right type, and then you pump it into them. So there's a system of uh, classification. Mm, that's going to surprise him, because really blood all looks the same, doesn't it? I can't believe it. Did, is there some classification system? Yes. I, I, I don't. I always thought that all blood was the same. There's different blood groups. Blood groups? Are, are there, are there, how many blood groups are there, do you know? Come in, come in. Is, have you got something to add to this? I, I'm, I'm astonished. These people have been telling me about, about um, that there are more than one sort of blood. Yes. They keep the blood in covers. In, in, in the they're stored in bottles. In bottles. In blood bags. What? In bags as well. I, I, is there anything else that we're going to have to tell him then about this? I mean, how much blood do they take from you when you offer it? And how much do they take? Paint. Anyway, how many think they can cope with Lister's questions on the matter of blood banks? How do they get it out of the arm? Do they just cut the arm and no, let it drip into a bowl? The tube in, the tube in, and, and it just, yeah, for, with a needle, they pull a tube in it and they stick it in, and then the blood just pumps out the body. It, is it a solid needle or...? It's a... Um, solid. solid. It's got... It's, got, it's a metal point and it's got a plastic tube joint on it. It's not always plastic. It's plastic? What, what's this plastic you're talking it's about? Metal. Is it like a... It's a substance. It's a bend. Bending substance. Is it like glass? Mm -hmm. It's that, 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 is, that is glass. Oh, I see. So I understand the glass, but... Uh, this is this, the tube which the blood runs through is plastic. It's got like a... What, what is this plastic? Is, is it like, a, it's like an, an artery or something? Is it? I'm not quite... I can't quite understand. See, like that's just, I mean, sometimes mm. you, um, you pump blood into people, right? You fill that with blood and you squeeze it and that pushes the blood down and it comes through the needle and the other person. I see, yes, I understand the syringe. And you know what they gave it? I mean, it was there on the teacher. I said, I'm just wondering whether we should uh, present Dr. Mister with anything. And they said, a modern stethoscope, because that old thing is got on his desk, <laughs> in right. So I got a modern stethoscope from the medical school, and a new white coat. And Lister was very intrigued by it. He thought it made lovely bandages. And she was like, you don't tear it up. You use it for operating. And of course, Dr. Lister said, oh, oh now, come, come, come. I use my old coat. Uh, it's very useful, this. I always put this one on when I'm operating, you see. She puts on her old bloody coat that we made. Uh, and then, of course, I'm fine. Get off. Don't wear that. You wash this every time. In carbonic. <laughs> <laughs> Real scissors. Then they gave him the stethoscope and he said, I'm not sure about this. And they demonstrate how it works. And he says, Oh, now I have a very good stethoscope because he pulls out the straight one that's still used in pregnancy. He says, This is wonderful. And the kids said, But you can't hear your own heart with that one. <laughs> <laughs> but with this one, you can hear your own heart. <laughs> 
and so she was presented with that. Yes. This is the kind of clothes that a, the doctor now would use in these things. Hmm. You want me to put it on, do you? It seems a this is going to be the strange material. Stand well back and let us all see. Would you like me to stay here and help me with it? You stay here and help me with it. You want me to, to put on this this. Well, I, I normally never take off my, uh, my my coat when I'm operating. I leave it on. But, uh, I wonder if he realises why we take our coats off. Well, he's in case you spill anything, so you won't ruin your own clothes and you wear a jacket like this. Really? Oh, so I can understand that, but I usually just have one coat uh, for operating and then... It doesn't matter if it gets stuff spilled on it. I just so wear it. I have um, dust on, and these are them um, sterilised. These sterilised? Yes. What, what does that mean? I'm not quite mm. sure of these modern like, words. Like, um, it kills all the germs. Everything. Bacteria. You mean you actually? What what do you do with them to clean them? I'm, I'm not it's quite sure. It's a special liquid, and you put the um, coat and liquid in it. Leaves it. Uh, you you actually you mean you wash the coats? Is that is yes. that what you say? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. After every operation? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. That seems amazing. I've I've yeah. never my operating coat. I never wash it. Too. Coat. If, if James in the air, get on your coat. It's like yeah. invisible kind of No, dust. no, look. I, I'm devising this whole new system, and it's the germs in the air. And because I've worn my old coat, it's covered in blood, and, and it doesn't matter at all. But if somebody, you've just been operated on, had a bad disease, and no. you had blood off no. from that person on your coat, on the blood no. would be the disease, and then you operate on somebody else, and, and the disease, disease could get it in the mix. But surely the germs would, would, it would, it would die off. They wouldn't be on my coat. I see. Ah, so this is why you wash the coats. So the modern doctors, do they wear, do all modern doctors wear? Yes. yes. But when they do operations, like wear green kind of plastic suit, yeah. Green? I don't like green as a colour. Why do they do that? I don't know. It's, it's any so colour, really. It's like, it's like mask over the mouth, so the germs are relaxed. Maybe you ought to see a mask. Has anybody got a paper hanky? Well, well, we could see what masks surely, are. Surely, when, like. when I work, I, yeah, I okay. need to breathe quickly, and I wouldn't. Right. Let's show him how masks yes, work and why. Right. Oh. Well, I think it's important, don't you? And then, then he gets it right. We don't want him learning it halfway. If we stand back, maybe you can see what you mean. Well, when you're doing an operation, you've got a mask, and it's it's got to go over yeah. here. Your nose and your mouth like this. Can, can I try that? You mean it's got to go? Now, now, why would they? Why would you want to do that? Because when when you breathe, it like if you've got a, it's like when you've got a cold or something. Are you saying? But I'm very healthy. Are you saying there are germs? Does everybody know this, doctors? Does everybody understand this? Yeah. this yes. Are you, even children? Yes. Oh, yes, everybody knows about it. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm amazed to think of the advances. And, and what's this in my pocket? You put stethoscope. You put them in the pocket. You put these two in your ears. These in my ears? Yeah, yes. What for? What to? Oh, oh! But I've got one of those, much better than this thing. I've got to. Excuse me. I've got my own, my own listening tube. This is, this is a much more direct. Is that what it's for? Well, of course, I use it for the chest and like this and. So this is the, this is what the twentieth century doctors use. Should I put it on? Yes. yes. You mean you put it just in like this? Yeah. 
Yes, it is. It's very effective. Do you think he looks a bit upset with him? I think he's very well in his day. Yep. I think we should probably explain that to him. Do you think we should? Yeah, we should. I wouldn't yeah, like him to think that the 20th century thought he was a fool. Yeah. Well, I don't think he was a fool, do you? No. no. It's just a matter of helping him understand what he really did do for us. Yes. Should, like Richard said, we should tell him tell him he's done very well. In for modern. Yeah, and we'll just never people even have now. just been adding on to things. Now we'll yeah. make even know yeah. so Well, let, let's stand in a big ring, then everybody can tell him what they think he did well for us. Because I'm glad Lister lived, really, myself. Dr Lister, we, yes. we, we thought you looked a bit sad then, and uh, one or two of us, or many of us maybe, would like to explain to you something. If it wasn't for you, um, inventing sterilisation, which is used <coughs> mainly now in the 20th century, thousands of people would have died because of diseases on instruments and on jackets and in the I air. I see. It's wonderful to think that people in the 20th century would carry on the work that I've started. In, um, and do you get some sort of... Uh, you, you get a certificate or you, you yes, pass? Yes. yes. And this is part of your examination? Did you get a certificate in your day, Dr. Lister? Oh, yes. Uh, would you like to see it? I've, I mm -hmm. always have it here in my office with me. Yes. I suppose you need to prove it, do you, sometimes, when people come and want to know if you're a real doctor? Well, they like to see it on the wall. It makes them feel better. I think you may have seen this before. There it is. It's my certificate. Did you do an examination oh, of historical yes. aspects? Oh, certainly. Mm. Certainly I did, mm. yes. May we just have a word? Oh, Do you excuse certainly, me? certainly. I'm just wondering if Dr. Lister would like to present you with your certificates for the examination. Do you think he might? Shall we ask him? Well, now, this has to be very formally done. I'm not sure how they did it in his day. Dr. Lister? Yes. When you received your certificate, mm. did all the people come to one place, or, or what happened in your day? Well, we all um, sat in the, the, the hall and they came up one by one to receive their certificates. I see. Uh, how would we have to arrange the chairs to have it done like you got it done? I think we'd have to have them in um, two or three rows. Go on, get the chairs ready. We'll have to come on. Dr. Lister, may we ask you to present the certificates in your old coat? not your modern doctor's code. And each person came up, received the certificate from the head of the university, and then went on to the, the, the examining doctor and was presented to him. She shook his hand. I see. So are you saying that I have to give the certificates and you shake their hand? Yes. Do you like that? Let it be known that Wendy Carroll has successfully passed the History of Medicine examination. Will Wendy Carroll come forward, please? <coughs> Congratulations, Dr. Carroll. Congratulations, Dr. Carroll, on passing the exam. Let it be known that Yvonne Elizabeth Yates has successfully passed the history of medicine examination. Congratulations, Dr. Morris. Now that's what I mean by changing the frame. And this is the amazing gift we've got to our schools. <coughs> it is not exploited. And of course it brings with it burdens, because if they are going to be treated as medical students, they have to be treated all the way through like black and you can't produce one minute. That strange kind of talk that only happens in schools and it's called teacher talk. It is not allowed. So when you say ladies and gentlemen, you have to mean it. There's no patronage. <coughs> it may have to be colonies, and you have to mean that. Now, if I may just end this one with, in the second week, she did all the classic experiments of Pasteur. 
but she did them not as a science lecture that my daughter had to go through. She did them as pasteur creating demonstrations of his work for a visit of Sir Joseph Lister. So the children grew all the moles. Do you know of any science class that has ever gone to a teacher on a Friday, as this group did to their teacher, and say, we can't leave all these moles around on the windowsill, you know, because if anybody gets in over the weekend, they might die of it. Have you ever heard a science class do that? They went to the headmistress and said, we've got 40 pound moles growing on our windowsill and they're coming on nicely. <laughs> <laughs> but we think if any landlords get in, this is a school, it's an inner city school, you see, an inner city school. Uh, if any vandals get in, they might get these in, scratches in their knees and that. So, at Winfin, they said, well, what do you think we should do with them? They said, well, we'll put them in the school kitchen fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wim said, do you think I should speak to the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they said, yeah, it's all right, we'll go along and have a word with her. <laughs> so we went along with them to save the day. And of course the lady couldn't believe it. But they wouldn't put these nasty moles in her fridge where proper school dinners are cooked and made. So in the end, I took half home into my fridge where my family did and we took it half home to her fridge. But the children were really worried about it. And it seems to me, of course, the one thing that children will always be known in the normal pupil conditions is there's no need for them to take much responsibility. Because it ain't worth caring about. Because most of what happens in school is a dummy room. So, drama helps you get rid of the dummy room. Not because we, made it, we didn't make any drama about that to this thing. The drama laying plan that the children assumed the responsibilities and were treated as such people so that they could care about the work. Does that make a bit sense to you? So mostly the drama that's done in our schools tends itself to be a dummy book. We're making this play for now. Or we're doing this this afternoon. And if we're not careful, that becomes the image people hold of our work. That it is transitory, temporary. And in fact, it's just like all the other work, but a bit less important. Whereas what I'm saying is, of course it's like the other work, but it's more important because it is how the other work begins to matter. Does that make sense to you, where I'm coming from? So one of the things I'm interested with you to look at is if you are happy to teach by changing the frame of the power of the children. Because what that enables, of course, is this whole semiotic to be completely broken into a whole new area of learning. And of course it does not mean, in fact it means less than ever, Letting children do what they please. It means enabling children to accept the conditions and rejoice. To take on not parts in a play, but roles in our society. They may call it a play, or they may call it playing. It doesn't matter what they call it. But they will be so endowed as to find it a terrifying importance which of course they will, they will deal with. Because the one gift society has taken away from children is importance. And it is a strange paradox that the most artificial thing in the world, the theatre, brings back authenticity to the potential of authenticity for learning. Because, you see, instead of keeping your knowledge as something over there, we're going to learn about Henry VIII, or we're going to learn about how to do this experiment, or we're going to do this, uh, pull back here and I'm going to show you this system in maths. We're doing something extremely simple. 
which any teacher could do and not call it teaching through drama at all, that is, you treat people as if they already are, not they sit there learning about. 